Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Channel 781 News Debrief. Um, this week, we're going to be going over the Better Bus Project, which is MBTA's uh, plan to redo our bus uh, routes. Uh, we had there was a input meeting on that, and George Darcy, the Ward Three City Councilor, uh, made a resolution criticizing that. We'll talk a lot about that. I'm joined by some critical mass members. Um, we'll talk about the Ward Seven uh, Master Plan meeting, which just happened, which was very well attended. Uh, we're going to talk about the continuing bike resolution sagas. I think there's three in total now um, that we'll uh, continue to talk about, as well as a uh, another update on uh, recreational marijuana and a couple other things. Um, but uh, today we're joined by Josh Castor. Hello, everyone. Emily Spear. Hello there. James Kikelis. Hello, room. And special guest, Eamon Dawes. Hi there. And Tom Benavides. Hello. Okay, um, so we're gonna first uh, talk uh, about the Better Bus Project because that's where uh, the critical mass is here for. Um, and I was not at the input meeting, James is, so if James, you could uh, lead this discussion, that would be wonderful. Um, yeah, so the public input meeting was uh, covering most of the Metro Boston area and had, it was conducted on Zoom and had breakout meetings for the various uh, uh, areas and Waltham was, one of the breakout areas that had a bunch of discussion. I saw some familiar faces there. After the um, public input, like Q&A, they had uh, comments from representatives and some of the representatives raised some of the issues they saw with the way that this was being conducted, uh, mostly bringing up like that it seemed like it was being done based on like mathematical optimization rather than taking into account like historical needs of neighborhoods or like uh, uh, historical usage of the of routes by neighborhoods, um, and yeah, that was about that was about the gist of it. Uh, Amen or Tom, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so there are definitely some uh, big changes for Waltham. Uh, some which are good, and some which are less great. Um, I'll say the big one of the biggest positives is that uh, the seventy bus is going to be running more frequently later into the evening. Um, so if you've ever been trying to get home from Watertown or Cambridge, I think there's three buses that uh, will be able to get you there after 10 p.m. Um, now it's going to be there's be like a dozen chances to get home. Um, but after that, uh, the, the downsides of the plan uh, come up pretty quickly. Uh, so the, the 70 is now terminating uh, at uh, Waltham Center uh, there at the Common um, and service beyond to Market Basket um, is now uh, a few times an hour. Um, and service to North Waltham, which was uh, typically North Waltham out to Cambridge was a, a one stop ride uh, on the 70A. Then a couple of years ago, we added the 61 um, and you didn't need to transfer at the common. Um, but now what you'll have to do if you, if you wanna get out to the city um, after the 70 stops in uh, the Waltham center, you'll need to take another bus that brings you out to uh, Market Basket. And then you'll be able to get on the 61 um, that serves uh, Bear Hill Road, which is sort of a new addition, um, snaking its way along 128 before being able to uh, do its traditional loop in North Waltham. Um, so for folks in North Waltham, there is a, uh, it'll be a much longer time on the bus. Yep. The uh, One of the things that they did try to stress in that was that it was a, uh, the, the the right you're talking about here, I think I've got highlighted, but it it in the market basket, uh, they'll be waiting for five minutes and then it'll change over to being the new lane to the new line. So if you're going from like up in Lakeview, you'd be taking a bus to the market basket, which would then be waiting and then taking it to go on to Waltham Center, if I understand correctly, and then go into Boston. Market basket lobbying. Yeah, they were talking about wanting to make that into being like a transit hub of some sort for, for, for the buses, which it's would require some major infrastructure upgrades, I would think. This, and this is also right around where they're planning on doing the um, the the one twenty eight interchange redesign mm -hmm. onto Main Street, which would probably have implications for that too. And I 
wasn't clear if that was being taken into account either. Yeah, so when we get really long routes like this, um, the bus drivers need a place to stop, use the restroom, and sort of have a break. Um, so uh, the market basket is a good place for that. They, you know, they can stop, they can pull over. Um, so, but yes, the, uh, while it looks like there's uh, four different lines converging uh, at market basket, um, it really is two. From what I could gather from the meeting, um, it was the 61 and the 58 are sort of paired together. Um, so the 61 goes to North Waltham, uh, the 58 will go down Moody Street into West Newton, um, and then follow Washington Street into Newton Corner. Uh, and the other two that are paired are the 53, which uh, goes from the Green Line up to South up South Street, um, and then to Market Basket, and that's paired with the 56, um, which will follow, uh, go through the South Side, um, and go to uh, Newtonville via, I think it's Waltham Street, you know, High Street and Waltham, Waltham Street and Newton and Craft Street. Um, so the 61, the 58 are paired. The, I believe the 53 and 56 are paired as well. Um, so it, it will still be a one seat ride depending on where you're going, um, but there will be that short little layover uh, at Market Basket. Tom, before I talk about uh, George's resolution that uh, was at this week's uh, city council meeting, as a general overview, how do you feel about this plan? Uh, I feel broadly positive as a whole. Waltham certainly has more of a mixed bag with this results. Um, but as Eamon talked about, a big thing is Market Basket becoming a new hub. Um, but also the corollary is like, you know, while North Waltham is now directed to Market Basket and have to wait for like the through line for the bus to change before getting into the city center, this now also connects um, Southside and Ward 7 directly to Market Basket, removing that connection. So it is sort of like an even trade off in that way, especially given that Southside is much more densely populated uh, than North Waltham. It affects a lot more people. And the second thing is frequency as well, uh, because while looking at the old bus map, there are like a lot more routes. Currently, the vast majority of them are only uh operating during peak times none of them go into the evening or run on weekends now pretty much all all of the routes except for the downtown express that go in waltham with redesign will be operating through the weekends uh so i think in like a holistic sense there is like less spatial coverage but a lot more frequent rides not necessarily frequent beyond the 70 bus but a lot more uh consistent throughout the week rides mm -hmm. Um, so George, uh, I think, I think it's hilarious if you remember like six months ago, uh, George was making a big push for, um, for more public transit in North Waltham and six months later, MBA TA responds by cutting services instead of adding them. Um, so he comes up with a resolution that uh, was unveiled uh, via a presentation that actually worked for once, um, which is rare, uh, in the city council chamber, um, just outlining, all of the uh, lines that were cut. Essentially, a lot of the lines in North Waltham are cut, and George is, is not upset, is, is very upset about that as a War Three City Councilor. Um, so, in in his presentation, he makes three demands that he's hoping to bring up in the next committee, uh, which is inviting uh, both our representatives, uh, one that sits on the City Council, um, uh, State Senator Mike Barrett and the mayor to talk about this and hopefully he's hoping that they're in support of this uh the next one is is i don't know if it was almost tongue-in-cheek but he's just asking the mbta uh to make us pay less money in taxes if if we're going to get less bus coverage um which i assume was tongue-in-cheek but it's 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 in public record now and the third is is looking at is hoping that the um traffic commission or, or the mayor, I forget exactly who, looking into just building a municipal bus service, um, kind of like what Lexington does, uh, which I thought was very interesting. It's not really that outlandish of an idea. Plenty of cities do it. Um, so I'm curious if, if um, anyone else on this call has thoughts on municipal bus services and if Waltham uh, would benefit from it. I'm just realizing, looking at the map. So right now I have pretty much... Um, almost door to door transportation to work because I get on the 70 on Main Street near Market Basket and I take it all the way almost to MIT. 
And that's part of the reason we moved to this particular address. And I won't have that now. I'll sort of have that, but I'll have to take two buses and one of them doesn't look like it goes very often. So for people, for me, at least, though, well, first of all, I don't have to go in every day. Also, I can walk to, to Waltham Center if I have to. It's like a maybe 15, 20 minute walk. But for people in North Waltham, it seems like a much bigger deal because now this route that went up through the middle of residential area is now going up on the west side of Prospect Hill. Hill. So every person who previously had access now has to go over the hill to get on a bus to go south so then they can go east. And it just seems like bad news for for North Waltham. I appreciate what Tom's saying that there, are, um, you know, if you look at it more broadly, there are reasons for it. But looking at it from my own point of view, I'm not too happy about it. From the narrow North Waltham view, it definitely is disappointing. Um, you know, I take the 61 bus down to Moody Street. I couldn't do that anymore, and I'm pretty happy to walk, but it's not a super quick walk from Market Basket to Moody Street. Like at that point, I might as well just be walking over from my house. Um, it's not a, it's not ideal. Um, I know it's hard to like make all parties happy, happy um, but from the narrow view, it doesn't look ideal. It looks like Market Basket will be a hub for very bad, inconvenient bus routes. Like, if you're at Market Basket waiting for a bus, you know you're not getting home for a while, kind of thing. I don't, I don't really see the hub there as being a benefit for, for Market Basket because it's only connecting to routes that everybody's going to hate. It's like one of those transit hubs that people are just like sad to be at. <laughs> It is unfortunate because like there is some kind of sense that it does make having like you know a destination like you know big box store stuff plus like grocery store with like, where transit is but it's also just like right next to the highway and like there's not a lot of good like pedestrian access to that area at all and like yeah there all are... those bus routes are going to spend a lot of time at a red light trying to get into market basket and like yeah it's a weird place to do a hub because it just takes forever to get in and out of. Interestingly, the 61 bus does go up Bear Hill Road now. So at least two dispensaries now, if not more on the way, will be on bus routes if this goes through. That's a good point. That's a good point. As well as the newest 41B development at Bear Hill Road which McMiniman, I think that's how you pronounce her name, was explicitly complaining about how people who need affordable housing won't have access to a bus route. That is now very much flipped. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it is like trade-offs. And I will acknowledge I am someone who always chooses to walk to, who lives in Ward 9 and chooses to walk towards Waltham Common to take the 70 bus, and that's 90% of my bus rides. So I'm biased the opposite way. Yeah, I think I'm in the same camp, and I thought it was interesting, too, that they, in, in the plans, are routing everything around Moody Street, regardless of what happens with pedestrian. It's just every single bus is going to go around Moody Street now, which is interesting because it's been brought up that, like, there's too much traffic spilling over onto Crescent Street, and now, basically, by default, all buses are going to be riding down Crescent Street you're dealing with real people and drivers have to know routes and stuff and if it's changing based on what random cities are doing it's not necessarily something that's sustainable which is why generally i do like the idea of um darcy's municipal, municipal bu uh, bus networks to fill in those gaps that are very waltham specific like i i personally wouldn't trade anything from the new bus redesign but more service is always better um yeah it just comes with certain things where um you know, I think one of Darcy's requests was having the um, bus that goes to Waverly, like extend into Waltham, which is like one of the highest frequency routes and highest density areas going into what is the least dense part of Waltham, which is the least dense part of like the Boston Municipal like bus network area. Um, so I think a lot of things that don't make sense from an MBTA perspective would make a lot of sense on a municipal level. So while I disagree with a lot of his like statements on what the MBTA should do, uh, I do like the idea of a 
of a city run uh, bus network to fill in the gaps. And, and we have municipal buses to some extent, um, you know, between Bentley and Brandeis, they run buses and shuttles um, in North Waltham, where Bentley is, um, and around uh, the south side, uh, they go up to Market Basket uh, for Brandeis. Um, so there is already, maybe not some of the infrastructure, but some of these routes have already been uh, sort of planned and developed. Uh, I think it would be interesting if, you know, the city could come into some partnership with uh, those colleges to have them contribute some money to a local Waltham, you know, municipal bus service that could service, uh, you know, residents, um, you know, full-time residents and students alike. And if the MBTA is going to be declaring things like transit hubs to, if the city was then actually getting, making it easier for people to get to those areas. Yeah. Uh, we also already have a bus, a uh, municipal bus. It's the Waltham trolley, uh, which is just severely underutilized uh, and undersupported. Uh, so really just rethinking that route would be useful. Um, I would also be remiss not to uh, share my screen and show uh, during George Charles's presentation, he called the Better Bus Project the You Better Walk or Bike Bus Project, which I thought was just fucking hilarious. Um, and so I want that to be on the public record uh, that George decided to use that on the public floor. Um, so thank you, uh, Tom and Eamon, for coming on and talking about this. Uh, this is a huge project and will be a continuing uh, saga uh, on this show as well. So thank you for your input. Yeah, thank you for having us. Of course, you're all. Thanks, guys. Thanks um, so we're going to move on to the Ward 7 meeting, um, the final uh, Ward-specific um master plan meeting. Uh, there is going to be one more citywide one on the 29th, um, which you should intend where anyone from the city can uh, speak about anything they want uh, as a vision for Waltham. Um, it, we're talking about the Ward 7 meeting uh, specifically right now um, because noteworthy wise, it was very well attended. Um, it was probably the longest meeting uh, from public input standpoint, and also the best attended, 60, 70 people uh, were there. Um, and that is largely, I think, thanks to the city councilor, uh, Paul Cates. Um, he was door to door knocking. Uh, I live in that ward and I got two flyers from him. Um, and I know that he was canvassing my neighborhood as well, uh, just chatting with folks and letting them know this is real. Uh, so really hats off to him. I think that is exactly what a city councilor uh, should do. It's also the only one that I know that did do that. Of course, you know, I live in this ward, so I know that. Um, uh, did other councilors do that? I didn't hear. Um, so really hats off to Paul. That is exactly what he should be doing. Um, and uh, and Josh, uh, we should, I should have brought this up sooner, did speak as well at this meeting, spoke very eloquently on the Colonel uh, property um, in Waltham. And so you should check out that out, uh, but really just a great uh, collection of stories from people. I was glad I went actually, because I what I guess what's surprising there were a lot of people there. There were a lot of people speaking, and sometimes you get the sense like on social media or, or at some other meetings, like Waltham's really divided on things like you know bike safety versus car centric development or affordable housing. And it didn't seem that way at this meeting. There were a lot of people speaking, and a pretty people from um, you know different ages, different points of view. And like, there were a lot of different opinions, but there was a lot of overlap too. Like you didn't see a divided <laughs> community. Like a lot of people are concerned about traffic and well, some people are concerned about it from like a let's stop developing point of view. Most people are concerned about it from a let's start transitioning to a bike and pedestrian centric point of view. And that seems to be pretty much of a consensus of the people at Waltham at these meetings, even if it's not the consensus of all of our elected officials. There was also a really wide variety of issues people brought up. Some people had a lot of interesting background. Um, there was one guy who talked about the need for a swimming pool, which is not something that Donnie I'm, Lucenta. Really I'm interested in, but it was really interesting because he had a whole history of why we don't mm -hmm. have a swimming pool. 
Um, and so it wasn't, um, it, you didn't see like a divided community. You saw a lot of common themes and I hope those common themes actually, you know, influence the process. Councillor Cates made some comments at the end. They were a little longer than I think people expected mm -hmm. um, because he sort of introduced himself and went over all the things he's working on because I think he did that because this is the only time he's going to have this many people from his ward sitting in front of him. So he took the opportunity. He did a great job, I think, of presenting himself as like a cust for the customer service aspect of the job. But he also gave a quote about how before there's a plan, there has to be a vision. And he didn't really give a vision exactly. He said, <laughs> um, you know, one thing he said that sounded like a vision was that someone should be able to ride their bike from the southernmost part of, of, of South Street all the way to North Waltham, uh, either walk or ride their bike safely and um, the whole way. That's the kind of thing I would like to see in the master plan, those type of goals. But that wasn't most of his talk. And, you know, same, um, it was kind of like when Councillor Harris spoke at the end of her ward meeting. It was like her talk touched on some of the things that were discussed in the meeting, but didn't quite catch, you know, give give a vision that that went with what people were talking about. So I guess, you know, my concern about the master plan, it's going to include a lot of stuff like this, but this, like, you know, we need more housing, but we need to preserve single family zoning. And then it's not really like useful when people are taking votes. There was actually a guy there who's on the Conservation Commission. He made interesting comments because he explained how a document like this actually could affect decisions because he said other boards when they're making decisions will sometimes consider what is the overall direction we're heading do we want to be bike friendly or do we want to be only car friendly and things like that so a master plan if it gives that type of vision because it sounded like could actually make a difference and i hope that's what ends up in it and not of like uh, let's do this but also this kind of way right. Amy, you were there did you have comments on it yeah, so I, it was, I've been to, I think I've watched all of them and I've, and I've been to a few. Uh, I think it is it is surprising, as you mentioned, sort of the um, agreement people see to, seem to be in around, um, you know, what direction Waltham should take. I thought there were some, uh, some people had interesting questions about what will a master plan look like? And, you know, are we here to talk about our goals? Um, and what we want to do and how we prioritize competing interests, or are we just saying, you know, projects and specific things that we want done? Um, so I think there's still some confusion uh, in the residents of what a master plan meeting is. Um, and I know I, I mentioned this uh, to you, Joshua, at the end, but it was, it, it's sort of a, uh, it's, it's a sign that, you know, Waltham doesn't have great communication if it requires a city councilor going to everyone's door um, and canvassing and flyering to get the word out uh, for these kind of events. Um, uh, so I know some have been more well attended than others, um, but I think I, I know as uh, the work you all do here to get um, the word out and try to let people be uh, be more informed, I think you know the city still has a long way to go in you know getting people just aware that these meetings are happening. Um, I, even, you know, I, I'm on Twitter and I, and I see what's going on and I feel like sometimes there'll be good notice and good postings about a meeting, maybe even three or four times. Um, sometimes it'll be like the morning of, oh, this is happening um, somewhat frantically. Um, so I, I think having a uh, sort of, they, they certainly need, need a more mature approach uh, when it comes to communication about um, things like what the, what the master plan is and what they're trying to achieve and, you know, when the opportunities for input are. And that came up a few times during the meeting. There was one person who said they didn't live in the war, but they weren't notified of their ward meeting. So they were here to talk. There was another person who made uh, someone who had been involved in Waltham for a long time, had interesting comments on a lot of stuff, but he said he owned a business in another ward, but he didn't go to that meeting because he didn't hear about it. And then Councillor LeBlanc, who ran the meeting, he kind of acknowledged Councillor Cates, excuse me, for the extra effort he did actually canvassing his neighborhood. And Councillor LeBlanc said he and his family actually helped with that, but it kind of almost begged the question of, well, what, what was done with all the other wards? Why are there so many people saying that they didn't hear about the other wards? Yeah, we've talked about that uh, on the show before. Uh, th the questioning how serious the city was was taking these meetings because Waltham has the 
ability and funds very easily to send out a mailer to every single resident of Waltham about this. They, they do with that for other occasions. And if we're talking about the master plan of Waltham and from these committee members talking about how serious they're going to take this and, and this is how things are going to get done, it's just, I'm not really seeing it from a from an accountability standpoint, and not to mention also that this master plan is totally toothless and without a consulting firm backing it up, there's no reason that they should listen to the to the to the master plan itself. There's That's no another thing I meant to mention. Uh, in his at the very end, Councillor um, LeBlanc, in his comments, sort of trying to summarize what the rest of the process was. He wasn't that specific, but he did say there was a consulting firm. Oh, look at well, that. I don't know if that's a new development, if that was planned all along, or they just decided that now that they have so much feedback and data, they're trying to figure out what to do about it. But that was very interesting. Well, I'm glad they that. took our advice. One of the things that I thought was interesting was that they talked brought up that there's a framing of like uh open space versus like wanting to have like you know housing and and like housing development basically happening and presenting them as if they're at odds with each other in some way and like in a lot of ways it's having a, a real systemic approach that takes into account everything requires addressing both things simultaneously because you don't want people aren't going to want to live in an area that isn't like doesn't have open space and isn't approachable and part of having like an intelligently designed city is having it so that you can have high density that isn't going to cause tons of traffic and that isn't just a you know a, a bunch of concrete blocks what was interesting with the the um bringing that up is that like there wasn't like a lot of th things that would get presented there wasn't a lot of consistency in like the complaints because they uh single family zoned house getting used by landlords to rent out to a bunch of college students to get brought up again in this meeting as well but then also adus got brought up accessory dwelling units and it was presented as a problem if like a house on the street goes from having like uh, one or two cars in the, in the parked on the street for it to five or six from tenants. But then at the same time, if every single house on a street gets turned into an ADU zone or gets allowed to have an ADU by right, then suddenly every single house on the street is potentially going to have like one to two more cars, which <laughs> seems like something you should be taking into account in a master plan rather than just sort of signing off on. Like you should have some kind of plan for developing like these things in a way that accounts for transit and accounts for delivering infrastructure to where people are going to be living. And just up, it, it's interesting because it's like almost like a backdoor to upzoning an area to increase the amount of housing stock, but it's one that kind of doesn't end run around like what else, what else needs to be there to support people living in, in, a, in places. And if you look at the MBTA map, if you've got a bunch of ADUs where there's not great bus access, suddenly that's a lot more cars that are definitely going to be parked in parking lots for parked on the street versus if there's if the development happens in areas where there is transit and people aren't necessarily going to be parking cars. Tom, were you there also? I was not there, but I was watching oh. the live stream. Oh, got it. Did you have any comments on it? Um, none that aren't ideological. I, I watch these with a very uh, specific motive in mind, which is for more housing and more non-car dependent infrastructure um if you're curious about the more ideological bit i've i've found that like a lot of people who focus like specifically the conservation committee dude uh who was focusing on the more broad I ideological stuff he also kind of told on himself when like i, I don't want to read too far into people so you can just cut this but basically when he referred to residential areas he was speaking of single family home areas he didn't view denser development as residential areas. It was very, this like exclusionary view. Um, and I forget if it was him or another dude who was also talking about how when planning, kind of similar to how y'all were talking about, you got to talk, talk about how to get from like residential areas to commercial areas. Like think of this very like 1950s, like urban renewal, um, segregation by design, sort of like thought process for zoning when in fact the solution is also um, there should be mixed use development. Someone should be able to live within a five minute walk of a grocery store or a corner store and a park and all of those things. And that is how that dense development can happen. And I think that's something that, the reason I mentioned it though is because that's something that 
conflicts with some a lot of people's ideas of a residential area. So anytime there are more people, regardless of how thoughtful it is going to be, the fact that there are more people is going to be perceived as an attack on like the residential area, the community character that they expected when they bought their house or whatever. Interesting uh, anecdote about the guy you're referring to uh, of speaking. His name is Bill Doyle. Bill also sat on the Fernald Reuse Committee, uh, which was a res residential committee. It wasn't uh, the city council, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, and they developed a master plan for the Fernald and it was released like, God, I, I have no concept of time anymore. I feel like it was a couple of years ago, uh, might be plus or minus. And the city essentially did nothing with it. They've developed a whole committee. They developed a whole plan. They spent hours and hours and hours. They basically did nothing with it. I'm not even going to talk about whether or not it was a good plan or not. Um, but they developed a master plan. Uh, the city asked them to. Or they developed it. And the city was just like, eh, okay. And then they did, did whatever they wanted, which is a new uh, plan that Josh talks a little bit about in the Ward 7 meeting. Um, and so that's my fear, again, for this master plan uh, committee is that they're going to spend a lot of time uh, developing it and residents are going to spend a lot of time, you know, giving their input uh, and they can just, the city can just decide to do whatever they want. I mean, they don't have to follow the plan at all, um, which is what I'm concerned about. They can. The only thing I would counter is if you do look back at the last set of master plans, there are a number of projects that are in line with the last set of master plans. So it does seem that I, although I think it's reasonable to be critical of, um, you know, do we have the records of where the supposed citizen input was gathered from? Um, because there doesn't seem to be a lot of records available for that. Um, I think it should definitely be evaluated. However, what's in the last most recent set of master plans has sort of, it does appear that it's been used as a bit of a roadmap for some of the projects that is that have been done. And, and Kathy Ann brings that up uh, also in her speeches about how she was part of those conversations and uh, got things done, but my my point my point is only that they can choose which things to which things to do. They can choose which things to put in the master plan. They can choose which things to do from the master plan, and there's, there's no accountability uh, from all this constituent feedback. And uh, last plug again um, for the last master plan committee meeting uh, is Tuesday evening. Um, I believe it's at Government Center um, and anyone can speak. Uh, and then we will probably talk a little, little bit about just a recap of this entire thing, this entire uh, master plan committee listening input session. It's, I think it's the 29th, so not this Tuesday. Tim, I forget what I just said. Yeah, 29th. Next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. Okay, so it's sorry, okay. next Tuesday. Sorry, the 29th. Um, okay, moving on. I'm going to talk a little bit about the continuing bike saga. There's three things that uh, I need to talk about, um, which is George Darcy's resolution uh, uh, from the bike, uh, from the Lexington bike lanes, um, which was the first time it was talked about. Um, the the bike and pedestrian uh, ad hoc committee, um, and then Kathy Ann Harris uh, with a bike rack resolution. Um, all of these were in uh, committees, uh, and so. First up, Public Works and Public Safety, George Darcy introduces uh, a resolution looking to get money for a feasibility study towards looking at if we should construct separated bike lanes on Lexington going up uh, to North Um Unsurprisingly, uh, this was immediately referred to the Master Plan Committee, um, which I talked at length about before, about you know, you can think that it's a good idea or a bad idea. Um, certainly there's evidence, uh, both if you want to have an opinion, either way. Um, it is concerning to me. Uh, you, to, to consider it, skipping ahead, Kathy Ann Harris has a resolution uh, that she talked about um, looking at building bike racks on the south side. Apparently she had done this years ago and it got nowhere. She's hoping now that it can... Um, 
that it can succeed. It was in economic and community development, um, and the committee talked about it, and you know there was a back and forth as, as committees happen, and it was approved, uh, and which is just the start of the conversation. Uh, they're now hoping that the traffic commission and the mayor. Uh, hopefully does what they want to do. I think they're gonna come back with a plan uh, and Kathy Ann will have to submit another resolution even looking at this. I don't want that resolution to go to the master plan committee. That is not what I'm trying to say when I criticize uh, that it happened the way it did. That is exactly what should have happened because that is how the normal council works. Uh, it goes to that committee, they talk about it, it's not. George's bike rack resolution, uh, bike lane resolution, goes to the master plan committee because that is where it should happen because, because it's a big idea, because it should be thought about in a grand scheme things. Why did it have to move there? Why didn't it just stay in public works and public safety, which is a committee that talks about these things all the time? Why isn't it just talked about there on an open floor instead of to a committee that again, has never once in its entire existence met has no plan to meet. When are they going to talk about it? I have no idea. Um, instead of we could just be talking about it in public works and public safety. And so when I criticize that Kathy Ann had a much easier route, I'm criticizing that George had a harder route. It should have been the exact same thing. It should have been talked about in public works. It should have been approved or not approved or invite and had more people invited. It should there should have been just a linear path for this. And now it's in the master plan committee, uh, which has never met. Um, and so that is essentially it to make a long story short on uh, that uh, committee. Uh, John Allen uh, did speak on that as well. Uh, a good resident that cares a lot about uh, bike and safety. If you want to hear him talk about that, the recording is online. Um, and so that is essentially it. The bike and uh, pedestrian ad hoc committee uh, is sitting in the master plan committee. Uh, the master plan committee has not met. And so we're not talking about it ever again, maybe. I, I, I have a nugget to share about that, yeah, actually. Please, so uh, Councillor uh, Kate mentioned wanting to go from uh, South Waltham to North Waltham. Uh, so I have crazy harebrained schemes, uh, and I just emailed him one. Um, and he said, I appreciate your thoughts and ideas. There should be future meetings, plural meetings, to focus on the bike infrastructure particularly. And the master plan committee is going to form a committee specifically charged with studying this in more detail. So it sounds like uh, he says Council of Bank will it will have more information, but it does sound like there will be plural meetings to focus on bike infrastructure, particularly now maybe bike and pedestrian stuff. Um, but it seems like that there they will have a. A, a sub sort of a subcommittee to study um, bike potentially pedestrian stuff, um, and that it will meet a few times. I don't know if it will be. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be open to public meeting and uh, public input and just it's public input only on bike and pedestrian infrastructure, um, or if it is. Um, you know, I really don't know what the format is, um, but it does sound like there are, there will be something. They will meet specifically to talk about bikes. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for that nugget. That is something I did not know. Um, and Paul has been one of those counselors that has forever seemed like he was on board. He's always saying very supportive of this. Um, and it actually goes into some of the other projects uh, that he talked about at this recent meeting. But he is often also one of those people that says, He's, he's literally quote for quote, just like not in my backyard. Uh, so he's often, uh, while he says that he supports bike and pedestrian safety, he has a lot of uh, hesitancy when it talks about something in his own ward. Um, and so, I mean, I hope I hope the council takes this very seriously. Uh, I just uh, I don't see it. Another thing that came up, I, I meant to mention at the, the Ward 7 meeting, one of the people who spoke said he was on the bike committee, that actually the mayor appointed a bike committee at some point in the past, mm -hmm. and it never officially ended, it just sort of petered out. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that made me wonder, you know, there was like 
a lot of discussion at bikes at this meeting and you know they didn't Councillor LeBlanc wasn't very specific about the process going forward but if the process didn't involve something serious on bikes it really wasn't going to reflect the input so I'm really interested to hear thank you that they are already talking about um doing a bike committee with at least a few public meetings that's good news I think I'm excited to see what comes of it um and uh, one of the last things we're going to talk about, uh, another weed update um, by Emily Superior. Okay. Here with another weed update. All right. Would you all like to hear first some good news or would you like to hear the whispers of an indecent proposal? Oh, good news. Good news. OK. All right. So this week, the full city council after much fanfare from George Darcy, the chair of rules and ordinances, um, 14 members approved separately the special permit for both Thrive Cultivation LLC and Uma Flowers LLC. So special permits have been approved for each of these retail cannabis businesses. Um, and they are both located on Bear Hill Road. The next step for each business is that the mayor will need to draft and execute their host community agreement. As I've mentioned before, we'll see how long that takes, um, but this is a big step. As for some of the other applicants, Waltham Cannabis had a pub another public hearing at the same city council meeting um, and Councillor Keats uh, made a point to bring up that the owner, Damon Schmidt, had reached out to him to basically ask, is there, you know, anything that I can do to help the process along? Um, you know, and Councillor Keats further read an email, um, you know, illuminating, um, you know, this and Kate's response was that all communications need to go through rules and ordinances. There was another email um, where the owner of Waltham Cannabis, Damon Schmidt, suggested a phone call between um, Kate's and Schmidt to talk more about the special permit. Um, but you know, Kate's just responded that he couldn't address that. Everything needs to go through rules and ordinances, but um, Councillor Cates did read those emails into the public record. Sort of that was that. The public hearing uh, took its course. Councillors asked questions. Um, a couple neighbors who addressed concerns before addressed uh, or voiced concerns about location. Um, but that was sort of the extent of that. The only new information from that hearing really was that the owner had contacted Councillor Cates directly, hoping to um speed up the process a bit i thought i thought that uh public hearing um was interesting because when we first started talking about special permits for recreational marijuana there was a lot of um public input uh in the negative sense uh, every single meeting was jam-packed with people that were just against recreational marijuana even like on principle much less just like logistically um uh, but as time has gone on, it's it's kind of just it's it's kind of the opposite now, or um, maybe not the opposite in the sense that it's basically no input. Um, a lot of these special permits now that are coming through, there's very little input, and uh, especially negative. And this special permit that just came through, Waltham um actually uh, reminded me a lot of those first few days because there was a lot of negative input. And this one was more specifically logistically. Uh, this was for twelve sixty five. Um, Main Street, uh, but it, the entrance is actually on Cunning Lane, um, and there was a lot of feedback about uh, how people would even get to uh, the establishment, um, along with uh, a lot of other uh, complaints. Um, but a lot of grilling from the councilors, a lot of grilling from residents. So I'd be very surprised if this moved forward in the way that it's going. Um, but rest assured, we're going to talk about it again. I had a question, Emily, do you understand why they that particular one had to have another public hearing? It was because they are building a, a 
excuse me, a, a new building uh, and they're moving the building. So they had to hold a new public hearing because of that. So they're moving the design of where the footprint of the building is going to be. Um, and that required a new public hearing. And also the, some of the complaints were about the fact that they moved the location of the building too. Why did they move it? Um, this, they had mentioned that it was um, like the existing structure uh, was had, had some, it sounded like there were some things that weren't to code in it and that they were wanting to re, re relay out the building. And it was mostly just like the, whether there was gonna be parking spaces for employees in the back or parking for everyone in the back, it seemed like the, the main but like contention there. Emily, did you get the impression that, I didn't watch this part, did you get the impression that Councillor Cates brought up those emails because he was just being careful or because he was trying to portray them as behaving in a sketchy way and maybe that should uh, count against them? Um, I think it was reasonable for him to, in some way, um, just bring the information forward in in the interest of transparency, because there have been accusations, um, and actually even, I think, indictments um, in terms of um, bribes for cannabis retail establishments and other municipalities. Um, so that is a real concern um, if a retail cannabis owner who's trying to get a permit um, you know is reaching out and saying hey what can I do um, so I don't think that it was I, th I think being transparent is the right thing to do there um, because there have been some concerns around bribery uh, for these permits yeah, Emily uh, mentioned it, uh, but it was it was definitely strange. What I'll say is that it doesn't usually happen. Counselors don't usually bring up on a public floor, hey, these are the email exchanges I had with the special permit uh, applicant. It doesn't usually happen. Um, not that anything they said was particularly juicy, uh, but it definitely does not usually happen. I think that is going to cover our debrief. Um, so thank you, Eamon and Tom, for coming on and chatting uh, with us, even more so than uh, the Better Bus Project. Um, your input is greatly appreciated. And thank you to James and Josh and Emily, as always, for the continued uh, dialogue. And we will see everyone next week for committee meetings. Adios. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care.